<laughs> Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you very much. I'm not going to make a comment. I'll round up when we have all, when, uh, then after the next presenter. Uh, I'm just loving the infodemic. Um, for our, our people who have joined us online, please remember to send in your questions, not through the chat box, not through the, the chat here, but send it through the question and answer box in, in your screens. I hope you can all have that. Uh, our next last but not least uh, panelist is Dr. Sarah Kadu. Sarah, over to you. I hope you are well connected. Uh, thank you so uh, thank you so much, our moderator. Uh, good afternoon. I hope it's good afternoon to everyone. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, and as you may, you might have heard from the introductions, um, I'm, my, I'm Sarah Kadu, and I'm an LIS educator. So I'm approaching the meta literacy uh, from an educator's uh, insights and or oh, providing insights as an educator from an educator's perspective and anything similar to that. Being an educator, I didn't want to take on, on any other role. So this meta literacy, what does it mean to us? Uh, well, to me, I, I find it as one of these trends that have come up uh, in the information science field. And it treats everyone as a learner. Being an educator, I'm a learner. As an author, you a learner. As um, a publisher, you become a learner, and et cetera, and et cetera. So whatever roles we play in our different capacities, then we are all treated as learners as per um, the meta-literacy um, view. So meta-literacy envisions a, a learner as an active, and metacognitive producer of digital information, and especially in the online communication, and particularly the social media environment. And that is something I picked from uh, some of the scholars like Moki and uh, Jacobson. So functionally, I would look at meta literacy as an overarching extended literacies such as the visual, the digital, the web. I'm aware colleagues that you know all these various literacies, but this is just a reminder to you that meta literacy is broader and it encompasses all these various uh, literacies that we are familiar with. Uh, the overall objective of meta literacy uh, is that it recognizes the meta literate learners and that these learners must continuously learn. You remember what we normally pick from Alvin Toffler, where he states uh, that the illiterates of the 21st century are those who don't want to learn, relearn, and unlearn. So this meta literacy also borrows some ideas from Toffler. By saying meta literacy recognizes the meta literate learners and that they must continuously learn. That is something that uh, I really love from uh, the objective of meta literacy. And uh, meta literacy also considers a uh, four main domains. As we continuously want to engage in learning, it says you should also consider the four domains, uh, which include behavior. And it says that um, in, the, in the behavior domain, uh, this is mainly to do with what learners are expected to be, um, to be able to do up after successfully completing any activities. And those are mainly the skills. Like today we are attending the IFLA Africa section webinar. So what skills and the competencies are we going to, to, to acquire and then also be able to, to do with these skills, the behavior. And then the cognitive, uh, what learners are expected to know when you are um, undertaking certain uh, training, what are you expected to know? Your expectations. And then the affective. And it, it also observes that the affective changes at the learner's emotions or attitude. When you undertake some learning, there must be um, changes in you. 
maybe maybe in the emotions, the attitudes, and etc. And then the fourth domain uh, considered by meta literacy is the metacognitive, where learners think are uh, expected to think about their thinking. So when you are thinking about your thinking, you are actually reflecting of on how and why you had to learn. What did you do or, or what are you intending to do with that kind of knowledge you acquired? Uh, meta literacy, interestingly, um, has theoretical or uh, frameworks, guiding frameworks. And from the frameworks, it provides elements. So we are going to look at five elements of meta literacy framework, which include interaction, information environment, information use, social media platforms, and sources of information. So with the interaction, this is uh, the way we all inter interact with one another, how we create, how we share, and how we use information. Uh, and this, this is emphasized that this has particularly changed drastically. And I believe you can attest to this. The way we used to interact 10 years ago, is quite different from the way we are interacting today. So the second one, which is the information environment, the framework also observes that uh, today's information environment has also radically changed. And I, I believe you also agree with that. And then the third one is the information use. Uh, for instance, you have to think about ways you or your friends uh, actually use the information acquired. And a fourth one is to do with the social media platforms. The social media platforms are quite many. Uh, think about the tweets we make, the Facebook, the blog posts, and etc. All these contribute, or oh, the contributions we make to other people's Facebooks, blog sites, and etc. This has also had uh, um, an impact. And then the sources of information we need to consider where the information we use come from. And some information could be coming from those traditional all established sources, but much will be from individuals, just like yourself and myself. We are information creators. Now, having looked at those elements, we want to know what are, what are the benefits of this meta literacy? that is all overarching with the various um, literacies, the wave, the visible, the visual, the digital, and et cetera. So what are the purposes? Uh, one, there is critical thinking and collaboration among ourselves. Uh, meta literacy uh, promotes critical thinking and collaboration in our digital, especially in the digital age. Um, two, Social media and online communications provide a comprehensive framework uh, effectively to, to effectively participate in social media and online communications. And there is also the third one, which is knowledge management. It supports the acquisition, production, and sharing of knowledge in a collaborative online community. And the fourth one, uh, we, be, we get empowered. We be, there is that empowerment. And so the framework emphasizes meta, metacognitive reflection mm -hmm. as an empowering practice for learners. So I remember in my introductory remarks, I say that, that we are all learners. We are all learners in our various capacities. So if we are all learners, what roles do we play? Uh, the meta-literate learner figure shows that meta-literacy places emphasis on the whole person, how we learn, what we understand, how we are constantly changing through learning activities, and how we translate our learning into action, and how we reflect on our learning as a continuous process. So the meta-literate learner figure actually looks at three rings. The meta-literate learner figure uh, looks at three rings in which it places the meta-literate learner in the center, 
and then followed by the domains. And um, the third uh, ring is followed by the learners. So all these, the domains feed into the meta literate the, uh, learning environment. And then the participants or the learners feed into uh, the domains, the four domains that we talked about. So for instance, uh, the domains, remember we talked about uh, being affective, metacognitive, cognitive behavior. And then the, the learners or the, the participants in the meta-literate learner figure include the publishers, researchers, participants, communicators, translators, authors, the list is endless. And that, that is um, the meta-literate figure. So, um, in that meta literate uh, environment, a learner is placed at the center um, of the interrelated uh, domains of learning. And then the central, which is uh, the, the, the domains, uh, for them, the metacognitive domain refers to how we think about our own thinking and our reflections. And then the Cognitive refers to how comprehension or what we activity. Uh, that is the, you can call it the substance you acquire after. And then the behavior, I want to call it the effect uh, because it relates to what we are able to do after a particular learning activity. And then the last ring, which I say the third ring, these are the roles played by the various participants. So in conclusion, today's learners communicate, create, and share information from an range of uh, contexts using a range of information technologies such as social media, blogs, microblogs, uh, wikis, mobile devices, and apps, and virtual other virtual worlds. As information professionals, we should continuously learn so that we could cope with the ever-changing information landscape with varying learners with unique literacies. Our new roles as information professionals are come with new responsibilities to ourselves and to others. Meta literacy is a new framework uh, that recognizes and addresses this exciting and yet dynamic and changing information landscape. I thank you. Over to you, our moderator. Thank you very much, Sarah. I want to believe now I am very meta literate now. Um, colleagues, Ntabi, I am not seeing the questions on my side. I hope you'll be able to read out the questions from your side if you have any comments. But before I take comments from uh, all of you, I really found this a uh, very, um, the entire presentations I was laughing throughout, especially at the humor that the librarians have. I've picked here, uh, the, the uh, reference by Rachel to the emotional diet. As much as we are being emotionally fatigued, we also need to have an emotional diet. I have tried so many diets in my life. I think that's the next one on my list. And while we are having an emo, we need a call for emotional diets, then uh, Prof. Yeah, Collins talks about the infobesity. I hope that uh, emotional diet would deal with my in obesity, because we all know that obesity is a challenge. Now, if we have the obesity challenge and the in obesity, I believe then that's when our Dr. Kandu's uh, calling for the meta framework would help because we would learn. And having shared that humorous elements that were coming for your presentation, I would invite any of you, any of you panelists, to link that up. Uh, it it kind of links the the infodemic, the infobesity, and the need for that emotional uh, diet, and then also 
the, the call for continuous learning as is coming from the last presenter. While we are waiting to get questions from uh, the rest of the, or, or of the other colleagues online, any of you panelists could link, could pick on that. Um, uh, sorry, Chair. Um, sorry, Rachel. Uh, there's one question. Can you please answer the question? Then I'll wait for more questions. The question is to all panelists. Do they have suggestions about the best, I think how best to incorporate personal digital care into information literacy instruction? How best to incorporate personal digital care into information literacy? I think, uh, Rach, I don't know who wants to go first. Over to you, Yayanda. Thank you, Ntabi. I guess the question links to the, the one comment that I also made. Yes. Uh, Rachel, I can see you are up. Do you, you want to take that first? Yes, and um, thank you so much for the question. It's, it's absolutely so valid, Sue. And um, I'm going to respond from a personal perspective. Um, as indicated, one of my functions is, is being a certified ethics officer. And, and that means that I assist with organizations in terms of corporate governance and, and social corporate responsibility to make sure that companies um, support ethics awareness and value alignment with, with staff and engagement with stakeholders. Um, you know, so looking at vision, mission and values, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, so ethics officer is quite interesting because you don't handle HR complaints or things, but you know, you're looking at awareness. And um, as I said, you know, my own personal experience was that, you know, I'm struggling with digital fatigue. Um, my emotional diet, my psychological diet is being overwhelmed. And then one of my colleagues said was, Rachel, you need to practice what you preach. You can't be an ethics officer and then go and work all these hours and burn yourself out and be constantly online. And then you are presenting on digital wellness and fatigue. And it really struck me. And I realized I'm being a very bad example um, to my colleagues um, and I'm not promoting myself. So I think if we look at information literacy instruction as an example is, you know, trying to protect students from themselves, I think, you know, so if we go and pre-record our lectures, put them online, have Zoom or Blackboard or Moodle presentations online, then we give reading for students they need to go find online, question and answer sessions they need to go find online. So all the engagements we have between ourselves and stakeholders, ourselves and students, are being moderated digitally. So we need to plan our diet, weighing the quantities and the types of information we want them to consume in order to manage that process. So we have to be the examples and, and look at alternative ways in which we can engage with learners and how we um, measure their results and the outcomes, not just based on what is digitally available, but maybe looking at more physical or tangible outputs. Wow, I love that. Uh, any other panelists who wants to take on to that one? How do we manage um, uh, uh, the endemic, the, the infobesity from Chisita? Uh, well, uh, this is an issue that also relates to information hygiene. Uh, you know, as I said, I think uh, just as we need personal hygiene, we need also to have uh, information hygienic practices. So I think uh, dealing with this uh, uh, personal digital healthcare environment, it requires an integrated approach whereby you not only the information science uh, discipline uh, incorporating it into their curriculum, but also the information science practitioners 
working with also other stakeholders to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, citizens' right to privacy as they navigate and exchange information online, especially during this uh, COVID era, uh, their health records, uh, you know, the web pages that they log on to, uh, they do not fall victim to unscrupulous health care providers, uh, thereby, you know, ending up uh, maybe, you know, uh, buying a, a medication that is not proper or having their information uh, made public without their consent. So as the previous speaker said, uh, there's issues of ethical considerations to do with the privacy. So this uh, personal digital environment is a very important uh, area that I think uh, it should have space within the LIS uh, curriculum uh, because it is not only an area that students can study cognitive, cognitively, but they can also, uh, you know, do more uh, using psychomotor uh, and, uh, you know, uh, designing and coming up with maybe a, a, a software that can enhance the privacy of, you know, health care consumers are online and also ensuring that they are not, you know, duped by unscrupulous or fly by night health care providers are online. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Shisita. Now throwing the ball to you, uh, Sarah. Uh, Dr. Kadu, how do we then continue learning? Uh, 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 Prof. Shisita here was mentioning that we need to consolidate uh, uh, information. And while still doing that, consolidating it, we also need to filter. So how do we, uh, all that in the process of protecting our reader. So how do we filter what should come to us as information professionals so that we can protect others? As they say, protect yourself before protecting others. How do we continuously learn to do that? Dr. Kadu? Um, thank you so much, uh, our moderator. Oh, that is a very tricky uh, question, but nevertheless, I'll try to, to give my own insights. So for instance, I can take an example. Look at the, the fake news that is all over. Every time we've experienced or we've fallen victims of sharing this fake news to others. And then sometimes, you also take on the role as a creator of a fake news because you did not actually evaluate it. You, you use the word filtering. You didn't actually filter it. But the good news is we need to con continuously learn. I recently learned there are certain software out there that can help you in the process knowing and which content is fake that we can use. If there are images, they'll tell you when exactly the image was taken, the photograph. So it will give you all the details, the place, the year, the time. So you should be able to know this is actually fake before you share it with other people. And that requires continuously to learn. So you don't have to, to consume whatever comes your way. And I think that is uh, what I can share with you. Thank you. Uh, well said, well said, Dr. Kadri. It links to uh, Prof. Chisita's point of, we must learn how to sanitize, not just our hands, but even the content that comes our way, that sanitation. Um, any other question that's coming that your direction? The, the next uh, question says, uh, says, who is taking care of least professionals? well-being even as we acknowledge the extra roles they have to take on during the pandemic is from helen amuga who is taking care of least professionals well-being 
even as we acknowledge the extra roles they have to take on during the pandemic. I'm not sure who will take it. Mm. Who is taking care of the health professionals? That's a good one. Are you taking it, Rachel? Oh, yes. Yeah. So if we, if we go through turns again. And um, Helen, thank you so much for the question. Um, I'm going to come back to the, uh, to the ethics office function. And, and that then again links to our organization. So looking at our universities, or if you're working in libraries or other organizations, um, we generally refer to students to please make sure they regularly visit the institute's policy or guidelines. So we all know we've got discrimination policies or ICT policies, maybe not to look at Facebook websites while we're at work or, you know, looking at conflict of interest, etc. So you, we've got basic policies and guidelines uh, that we follow or that, that guides our behavior. But there should be some form of a policy that looks at the wellness and the well-being of, of a staff member. And these can even include, you know, how do you report issues to your line manager or to your HR representative? You should also be able to have clear guidelines to whistleblowing platforms. If you are finding it very difficult or there's unethical behavior happening, there must be a platform where you could blow the whistle anonymously. If your organization does not have such a guideline, then there must be an alternative source within your country or region where you could do the same. So this is something where awareness needs to be created. And, and that's why the role of an ethics officer becomes very crucial within an organization, because no longer are they risk compliance necessarily because risk could be financial or other types of governance issues it's not just an hr issue which you know we look at managing the human resources ethics functions on a different level which looks at the the behavior the conduct and the character of of our professional staff and i am aware that ifla does have a code of conduct and a code of ethics and i think we really need to look at promoting that support within the organization. Thank you. Oh, okay, so linking to that, uh, Dr. Kadu, would you say then it's our, we have a responsibility as information workers to uh, bring in these ethics into the frameworks that you brought, you, you presented, the, the interactive framework, the information environment, they use the different ways of using information, the, the social media platforms, and assessing the sources of information. These frameworks, we should link, learn to link them with the ethical, should I say ethics of the profession or ethics of information? How would you, how would you uh, connect those two? Uh, or they are not connected, uh, Dr. Kadu? Uh, thank you so much. They are absolutely connected. Remember with the meta literacy um, uh, participants are supposed mm -hmm. to work in majorly in the online communities, in the online environment. So if we are going to use the information, which is digital information, or we are going to create, we should take in the ethics. We should not be, we should not be the type of people who are going to create content that is going to be harmful to others. We want to share this information. You are taking on the, uh, the role of a researcher in the meta-literate figure. So as a researcher, you shouldn't um, plagiarize because if the, the content is out there, too much of it, uh, the software is going to catch up with you, the anti-plagiarism software. And plagiarism is an ethical concern so in all aspects, we cannot avoid ethics. We are supposed to practice ethics. We should be ethically upright in as we are learning, as we are imparting the knowledge, as we are sharing, as we are using, as we are creating. In all these roles that we play as information professionals, we should be mindful of the do's and the don'ts. Thank you.
Mm. So we should be also ethically correct with our being as information workers. Um, if I come to you, uh, Prof Chisita, I really appreciated your, your, your breaking down the etymology of, uh, of um, infodemic. And you, you, the way you present it, it's amongst us. Would you then say is as much of a disaster as um, the pandemic? And we, the WHO is giving us guidelines on managing the pandemic, the health part. Where can we get guidelines? How do we fight, develop our own guidelines of dealing with the infodemic? Because you are the way you are saying it is amongst us. Are you declaring it? Not really declaring it. Are you acknowledging that it's a disaster amongst us? And we need to find ways of managing it the way we manage the health pandemic. Uh, yes. Um, since uh, it's not only this uh, COVID, uh, even other pandemics, pandemics. You know, like uh, Zika, etc., even from 2009, etc., they've been. Uh, it has become sort of like a ritual that a pandemic, a preordained ritual that a pandemic is followed by an infodemic, and then action uh, or uh, a strategy has to be implemented to overcome both. So, uh, well who has guidelines and also has even encouraged the nation states to come up with plans and the teams that uh, you know come up with strategies on how to overcome the infodemic and uh, you know uh, ifla is also guidelines on how to counter fake news um, and you know uh, information literacy also has uh, digital and information literacy also has uh, that aspect on how you can uh, detect uh, fake news from uh, credible news. So the reason why it's because you see the the, the infodemic makes the pandemic uh, or the virus spread faster than anything uh, else because people are now relying on uh, information that is not scientific. So as a result, it, it becomes a source of danger, a source of a, 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 a catastrophe of grandiose proportion, you see, of equal importance uh, to the uh, pandemic itself. Hence, uh, the thronged approach to fight both the pandemic and the infodemic. Oh, thank you very much. So we must learn to help others learn to. That's interesting. Actually talking about the infodemic and, and, and the coming in of all this fake news, uh, may, for those of you, uh, uh, may I may announce that very soon, keep watching the screen, keep uh, following the, the, the communication from IFLA Africa section. We will be having another session in future. I'll, I'll, we'll communicate the dates. I don't have the exact dates at the moment. On, on fake news. We will be talking seriously on fake news. We won't be fake, but we'll be talking about fake news. Um, any other question from you, Tabi? No, I, I, I don't have uh, another question. Um, there is, um, Rachel, maybe you can go ahead. I see you made an announcement. Yes, um, so it's in the discussion of media and information literacy, um, I just added a link, UNESCO, um, they've already had the launch, the link I shared shows the launch that has taken place between the 23rd and the 30th of April, but you can still visit the website and um, see if you scroll down um, the information relating to this curriculum. Um, that, that has been updated and will be published soon. The summary is available online. Now, the theme that UNESCO had on this publication and the launch was think critically and click wisely. Um, and I think therefore we could really consider critical thinking and, and to be wise 
in our actions as far as possible. And um, I think it was a question that you referred to earlier, Ayanda, about um, what can we do to promote awareness within our organizations? Uh, what can we design, create, share and distribute? And this is something that I do feel quite strongly about is that we need to break down the silos between our organizations and our entities and, and to collaborate as much as possible. So if we look at UNESCO IFAP, um, it's the Information for All program. So this Information for All program looks at a number of areas which we do share that is cross-cutting um, on our discussions today even. So the Information for All program consists of six um, objectives, um, their areas, and these I'm also sharing the link with you here on the, in the chat box. Um, the objectives are information for development, information literacy, information preservation, information ethics, information accessibility, as well as multilingualism as a cross-cutting theme. So with IFLA, as well as faith, of faith, um, I think we should have faith in our projects, <laughs> working together with UNESCO and, and other entities within our own countries and, and globally, I think we could strengthen our efforts um, instead of trying to create our own content. Because if we continue in these silos, we really are going to have burnout. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, it is really, we really need that faith. Uh, I loved a uh, reference to a prophecy is coming real now, the infodemic prophecy and the pandemic, that, that always follows the pandemic. Um, we are coming towards the end of our session. Uh, anybody with a very, very burning point to share? Uh, um, anyone from my very favorite people who are serving as panelists today, any key thing to share? Um, Dr. Kadu, uh, Prof. Chisita. On um, Tabi, do you have any announcement to make? Um, I Can think I hand over back to you as chair? The announcement has been made uh, by Rachel that we will have a series of um, other webinars and meetings because we want uh, Africa to be active in the information space, especially for with the UNESCO. But we will we will send you the uh, requirements and when the meetings will be and when. The, the when will be our next session this was just to start off and just be active i like what rachel said she, she said something about faith and I, I i in my head it just clicked oh yes we should have ifla has a faith it has got faith maybe that we should bring them on board Fortunately, uh, the chair of faith is in South Africa and she's Ellen Tice, our former IFLA president. So we will probably just talk to her maybe in our next um, uh, webinar. Then maybe we can have a shared uh, collaboration with faith. Uh, it, yeah, that's all from me. And I would like to thank everybody for attending this uh, webinar and I really, really appreciate it. I know it's been, it's, it's a very difficult time for everyone. We are working from home. We have meetings from work and we are, we are really, really digitally tired. And we've been told so many times, you are, you are, you are, you are off, you just been cut off. You're talking, we can't hear you. You are muted, you know, that's, that's been our life now. It's no longer traffic, but it's been, you are unmuted, you are muted. You are, please mute yourself. Please talk uh, loudly, you're, you have been cut off, yeah. So really, I, I, I really appreciate you and I appreciate uh, everyone for attending. Thank you. Back to you, moderator. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, panelists. Um, actually, by my, my printer here, I have this written, uh, the gift of awareness. So this session has really uh, 
rekindled that drive for myself to be aware of myself and so that I can be able to serve others. And I'm hoping that it has done the same to you. Let's all hey, put a hand, our hands together for our, our very beautiful and very uh, uh, informing uh, panelists. And I also would love to really congratulate you all, colleagues, for having joined us. This is only the beginning. It is very purposeful that there are no slides, there's no presentation because we are digitally fatigued. This was just a realization and I hope you had your feet up. I had mine up. I don't want to show you how comfortable I'm sitting, but I hope you have had a relaxed session. Thank you for joining us. We will be inviting you to the next session. Have a good Friday. <laughs>